Okay. Um, so we basically want a script like so, um, where we've got, it's basically, we're making a Warren truss. Um, I've drawn two, two lines. You can see I've drawn a third one up the top. It's, it should just be like, you know, that standard Warren truss that we've, we've drawn like weeks ago now, right? Um, the critical thing, I can't remember if we did this or not, but we're going to use a panel to describe the dispatch and weave pattern. So that's rather than using the default. So that's one and zero, true and false. Um, and so the the uh, A comes out into one and the B goes into zero. So just to, I guess just whilst um, you might be whipping this up or opening something and, and editing it, um, generally what happens when um, people are asked to produce things like a diagrid, um, these, these types of structures um, that I, a lot of computational designers end up designing, um, they, they're very common, you know, we're, we're basically looking at a bunch of triangles where the, the slab behind the building is doing the, like actually making that a triangle rather than a diamond. Um, they, they're very good for sort of distributing forces across buildings. Um, it, you know, me, by me typing in diagrid, normally I get towers, but if I type in diagrid roof, um, almost every uh, th doubly curved structure that exists nowadays um, is made up of these diagrids. Um, and so you're probably going to need to use diagrids um, at a point in your careers, uh, where whatever you're doing. Um, the thing is, if I if I was just to ask you guys like how would you how would you go about making a diagrid? Um, like, have you guys actually taken a stab at this previously? I don't think so. Okay. So, the typical thing most people do is they'll they'll go onto Food for Rhino and they'll go find a plugin that basically does the job for them and um, in this case lunchbox you know lunchbox can actually produce diagrids right so like I can throw a surface into this diagrid system Bloop. and there you go I've got a diagrid I can control the the amount of divisions in one direction. And the amount of divisions in another. Um, and there's also like a little Boolean toggle that um, changes like the, the starting condition. Um, and that usually satisfies everybody, right? Um, but Usually, like if if you're gonna st if you're gonna use these types of systems, then you're actually starting to lose control over your script, because um, you know if I go back to um, some of these drawings that that we've found here, like for example, this is King's Cross Station in London. Um, you can see there's like an even division of columns. There's a there's a column system here that that this thing needs to line up to, and then there's a heritage, a heritage wall wall, and all of the structure that's coming in needs to node up at specific points that might not necessarily be where um, lunchbox is going to place them, and so normally, um, you know, 
if you're actually working on a real project, um, Lunchbox actually just falls apart. It, it doesn't it doesn't work. Um, and so you no, you normally have to build your own diagrid scripts yourself um, to be able to actually see through that diagrid actually working and noting up. And in in your cases, like working with Corumba, for example. Um, let's just quickly like if I just quickly plug this guy into uh, the evaluate length. Okay, that, okay, that, at least that, they've noted that one up. Um, but there was another one that Lunchbox did that was a bit of a funky one. Either way, cool. So, the reason people normally go to Lunchbox to do this is because you actually need to have a fairly good understanding of how data trees work in Grasshopper. Um, how lists work, how all of the, all the branches work. Um, so that's kind of where, where I'm coming from today is I'm going to try and teach you guys how we can make a diagrid and also sort of cement in your minds how data and lists are working in Grasshopper. I'm, I kind of look like a vice documentary right now. I'm, I'm basically a silhouette, right? I'm going to, I'm going to like close some of my windows. That's a bit better. Okay. So, um, everyone is familiar with. Everyone should be familiar with the the process of taking, um, you know, like a point, and m multiple other points. <coughs> Is that one point? Um, set multiple points. Can can anyone like if I was to draw a line between these? Can anyone just just shout out what what you think will happen? I've got already someone in the chat. Yes, Jacob, it will. Um, I'm going to upload all the lectures today. So if I've got if I've got a I've got a list with one point and a list with three and I draw lines between them, what are we gonna get? So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Yeah. So f uh, the first one point will uh, separate connect with uh, each point like the three points. Yep. Yep. That's exactly that's exactly it. So, Grasshopper does something um, which. Uh, I guess other software, uh, other coding languages might not do, and what it does is it repeats, it repeats the element in the shortest list, um, so that it 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 repeats the last element in the shortest list, so that it can connects um, to the longer list. So this element, it, this point, is basically being repeated two extra times. To then draw these extra lines. So, like if I if I opened up um, Python, for example, if I have in Python uh, a range, a range that that's ten long, and a range that is a hundred long, and where if I iterate over that range, uh, you know, in a zip, you guys have kind of seen zips before, right, in Python? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, so as we iterate over both ranges, um, because one of these ranges is, you know, a tenth the size of the other, um, we will either see ten getting ten items getting printed out or a hundred items. And so when I run this, 
I'm only getting 10. So Python, the, the standard Python zip function, it does the shortest list. So once it hits the shortest of any of those lists, it stops. Grasshopper does the opposite. It repeats the last item um, over and over again until uh, the longest list is satisfied. Um, and so we normally use that to our advantage. You know, we we have if we have three points um, and three points, then we um, we get an outcome that we look for. And if we only have uh, two points in one of these lists, let's redo that. Then the last one gets repeated. As long as we are aware of that, we're fine. Yeah. Um, now. Grasshopper also has branches, and branches, what, what they've done is they've effectively defined branches the way branches work the same way. So um, I can have, and I'm just going to quickly draw this up, if I have uh, a branch system like this and a branch system so this this list A is two branches so actually let's just delete this line one two three four and I'm going to use the component uh, partition list which is partition list is very similar to grafting so grafting you guys should all know what grafting does it puts every individual element into its own branch um, what partition this does is it lets us do a graft but then lets us actually define more than the value of one to, to place into those branches so in this case by partitioning this list into two I've got two branches which are being represented by these little boxes and then if I do the same with these points on the other side one two three four five six but in this case, I'm going to partition these as three, two, and one. So the branches here are being represented like so. What Grasshopper does is it treats the branch structures, no matter how those branch structures look. So um, like ignoring what the relation, like what these actual uh, branch values are, be they, you know, if I simplify this, be they one, one element long or a thousand elements long in their structure, um, Grasshopper just goes through consecutively and treats each branch individually as an object, just the same way it would treat a list. So, because we've, if we think of these branches now as objects, you know, ignoring the points, so Ignoring these points, um, Grasshopper will basically say this branch is going to connect with this branch, and then this branch is going to connect with that one. And now, because this list, this branch list is longer than the other branch list, this branch is going to be repeated to to make up for the fact that it's shorter. So you end up with a branch system connecting like so. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? So, obviously, you know, tip, typically then when the branches act with each other, they act as if they're in their own little systems. So Grasshopper is going to do this, right? And then, because you know, it's going to look at these two individually, and it's going to connect them. And then, what what do we think the last? What, what's going to happen to the last branch? Anyone? Would it connect to the last one on the um, 
<clears throat> left hand side. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna put some um, labels in. Sorry, who am I talking to? Orchi. Hey Orchi. Um so this last branch, this this last point. How many lines do you uh whoops, how many how many lines do you think it's gonna produce? For B two? Yeah, this B two branch. How many lines are gonna be connected to that point? To each of the A one points. Excellent. Perfect. And so, you know, if I if we actually just chuck this into a actual line component, I work that's that's the result, right? So the the length the the length of the list and the length of the branch branch lists matters. And a lot of what we do in Grasshopper once you actually start getting into like advanced grasshopper is actually just learning how to manipulate data so that it go when it goes into these components they they work well they work to what we expect so what i'm going to do is if we just talk about this like the diagrid system um Typically, if I if I said, "Hey, I've got two lines here. I want to do a diagrid between between this line and this line, and and then this line and this line." Um, the the usual way normally I'd, I'd have you guys in class, and I'd be like, "Hey, like you know, try actually work. How would you solve this?" And mo and I'm I'm telling you now, most of you are probably going to go copy this thing and you select like the other the other line and bam you've got yourself like the diagrid going between uh, those three lines but if I then started to say well you know what if what if the system can grow what if what if we had a system where we want as many diagrids ac across those lines as possible um, as in it can deal with an infinite number of divisions going in one direction then the copy paste method kind of just falls apart right because you're effectively um, you're effectively rewriting the script part you've you've put part of the script on yourself to become a manual process um, and so this is where the data tree method basically comes in so what what i what i normally do when i look at these diagrids is you know you can actually just see a warren truss um sitting in there so you can you can take your warren truss script and actually turn it into a script that makes diagrids um the way to do that is by making a warren truss between each of the diagrid sections so if I take this, these geometry components or curve components, whatever you've done, and I just select all of these lines together, what I can do is I can, I can take out the first, you know, I can say, hey, let's create a list that's this point, this line, and then in the second iteration, it's this line and so on and so forth. And then the the other way, there's like we've done this shift list. I've explained shift list before, right? We did that two weeks ago, right? Have we done shift list? You would have had to have done shift list with Will, right? For the how and the Pratt trusses. Yep. Okay. Good. Yeah, we did that. Okay. So we we we're going to shift these lists so that um, we're killing off the end line from the first list, and we're killing off the the beginning line from the second. So we want to turn off the the wrapping function, and one of these is going to be a minus one. The other one's going to be a one. So 
once I plug these in, we're starting to see the the Grasshopper scripts naturally turning itself into, um, you know, almost a die grid, right? It's processing each of these lists separately to be able to tr create those trusses. So why is it doing that? So when a component like divide curve is run, um, so that's basically any component that could possibly produce more than one outcome from a single input. So here we've got a single, you know, we've got eight lines going into our divide curve and out of that divide curve we've got points and these points are grouped based on the lines that created them. So um, you guys, you've probably played around with a component like offset. If I plug a, if I plug curves into offset, offset gives me uh, branches as an outcome. Does anyone, does anyone have an idea why they would be branched? There's not, and there's no, it is, is fine to be wrong. Just like, why might they be branched? What, what did I say about components in Grasshopper just, you know, a minute ago? Is this, this is a tricky, is this too tricky a question? Should I pick on someone? Okay, I won't pick on anyone. Okay, so what what's happening with this component? Why is this comp why is the divide curve giving us branches? Why is the divide curve giving us branches? Anyone? Is it because uh, each of the different lines um, is being divided? Yep, yep. So each line is being divided. And so, you know, the, see these points here? These points, Kieran, wh which which line do they relate to? Uh, it would probably be either the first one. If it's shifted... Uh... It'll, be, it'll be the first one. Like, it's it's the first line in the list that's going into the divide curve. So in the second branch, what are these points relating to? Uh, is it, has it moved down? Like it's the right hand side. Um... It'll, it's just the, it's the next, it's the next line, right? So, you know, in a way, see the, see the branch here, zero, one, two, that, that branch number is basically correlating with the indexes that are going into that that component, right? But what what's happening? How many how many like we're producing more than one point, right? Per line, and that's why it's making these in branches. Like if I go grab this other component, uh, evaluate length, and I plug that in, am I getting branches? No. But why is that? Because it's only produ it's producing a one to one relationship in that component, right? So why? So what does that mean for offset? Is it because you're creating a copy of those lines? No. So, it's okay. it's because offset can actually produce more than one curve. If I if I have a shape like this, now this always fails on me because offset breaks so easily. If I have a shape like this, and I offset it, we're producing one out one curve, right? 
but if I offset the other direction, you can technically see so this is this this whole thing always breaks for me. I don't know, it's so annoying. But you when if I offset this in in Rhino, it can produce more than one outcome for from that one curve. So, so these components and offsets are it's buggy, but just be aware of that one. Um, so these components are going to branch things automatically for you um, if they're going to produce more than one outcome. Okay, so what that's actually done is it's produced us a, like if I actually quickly look at this, um, at these points, These points are in a, they're in a list um, that then has another, like another dimension to that list. So I could actually describe, like if you actually look at these points, if we look at these points now, you know, with their indexes, we have, we effectively have a matrix. Um, and we can actually think of grasshopper trees and branches as long as, you know, as long as they're actually, they've got some dimensionality to them. So that being like, you know, they've got, there's the, this branch here is one dimension and then this, these indexes are another, then we can actually think of these as, as mathematical matrices and also geometric ma matrices um, and so you know, if I draw a line going from each of these points in one direction um, if we want to draw them in the opposite so as in if we want to create a branch structure that that takes you know all the the zero indexes and all the one indexes and put them into each of their branches then there is a component called flip matrix which will do that for you so once that's flipped you can see now when I when I put that into a polyline curve this is drawing vertical lines rather than horizontal have, have you guys been taught about flip matrix before I think we did in turn one okay good now the critical thing with flip matrix is that it doesn't, it only works on a two dimensional matrix. Like you can see here, this symbol shows like a page being flipped. Um, so if there were, if there were any extra layers to this data structure being, you know, after this is simplified, that there, there is actually two numbers, two numbers in each of these branches rather than one then the flip matrix won't work because it doesn't know which direction to flip the matrix. There is a, a plugin called um, TreeSlough, um, which has, has a component called flip last, which what that does is it, it flips the, the last value of, in the data structure, in the branch structure and the, um, the index indexes rather than so it knows kind of what what you need to do it it basically sorry it, it allows you to do any dimensional matrix um, but it just assumes that you want to flip the last one so if you want to flip the second to last one and the last one you need to somehow reshuffle your data in some way to be able to get that to flip and I don't think you guys will need to work with flip last for a while but we'll we'll see maybe in the second half of this term if there's some things that we can do with some flip last okay so we can think of this data as a matrix and we can also think of the data at like you know wrapping and we can think of it as um we can think of it as repeating data so you know in this case i've got a a pattern that is going true false true false 
and that's just getting applied. That's that's one branch getting applied to all of these different branches, which is then creating this diagrid-ish looking thing. But what do we? What can we do now? What do we need to do to get this to work so that it actually creates a diagrid? Basically, this Warren truss looks fine, but this the second Warren truss needs to be like flipped in a way. And we can flip Warren trusses um, using our script by inverting or flipping the the dispatch and the weave. So if I put in a dispatch weave pattern of zero one, then I end up getting uh, reversed Warren truss pattern. So now this this is where s some some trickery comes into play. If I describe my pattern as zeros and ones, but I describe them in a single line, so you know the first pattern can be zero one, and then the second pattern can be z I mean sorry one zero, the brain freeze. And then uh, the second pattern is zero one. So these items can then be broken up into their individual components using a tool like uh, blah, 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 what's it called? Characters. So if I put one zero and zero one into characters, because we are producing what characters does is it, it basically gives you each individual character in in a string. Um, because there are multiple items coming out of each line, each string, they're going to get branched, and you can see here they're getting branched. So zero one, I mean sorry one zero zero one. So if I just quickly plug this in to my dispatch now, we're going to see, and the weave, we're going to see, you know, an effect, something that, that is getting us closer to the effect that we're looking for. Is everyone at this point? Do, do I need to explain what's happening here a little bit more or not? Oh yes, please. Okay, so these these are strings, right? Like we're, as when we when we type a number or text, um, the number can be treated like a number. So you know that's going to get calculated, and it's actually going to come out with a number. But the the text is just going to break, right? But no, numbers can also be tr treated like strings, and in this case we're when I'm writing these numbers in, um, I'm I'm writing them like they are strings, um, and it's almost like saying, like if I I could also say, hey zero one, as a one zero zero one, and then do a petition list. I'm just skinning. I'm skidding the the scripting cat um, in a way that is a little bit reusable. Um, so we're writing single lines that represent branches, branch patterns, and then we're using the characters function to split that up. So if I use characters on any string, you can see it's giving us zero uh, one zero two zero six five, and then there you can see Andrew Butler, all the different characters getting split out. And the reason I'm doing this is so that um, I can take this pattern and actually repeat it by looking at another piece of data. And, and we'll, we'll talk about how to do that in a moment. But what is happening here? What what are we seeing? We're seeing the, the first Warren truss is following the one zero pattern and the second Warren truss is following the zero one pattern and then because we're, we're comparing two branches now you know we've got a branch system here 
of 1001 and a branch system of you know points there's more branches in the points than there are in the patterns and so the pattern is looking at the last item in that pattern that last branch which is this one and it's repeating that branch over and over again so the 01 pattern is getting repeated here 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 and here and so on does that make sense yes cool so what we've got to do is we've got to because we know grasshopper is going to repeat the last item over and over and over again we've got to refit reconfigure the data so that it doesn't do that so the way that happens is we, we've got to make sure that this list or this branch structure list is the same length as our point data um, and when we make it the same length we need it to follow a rule system which is repeat repeating or wrapping or alternating um, so there are components that let you do that, like uh, longest list and shortest list. Have you guys been taught about these guys? No. Okay, cool. Um, also, there's another, there's cross reference as well. So these components, let's just go demonstrate what they do off to the side before. I do anything. These components um, basically force Grasshopper to work uh, differently. It lets you break that longest list rule. So here you can see longest list repeat last. That is the default rule that Grasshopper follows. Um, so I'm going to go A, B. One, two, three. And I'll just um, do a string conco concatenate, which just basically combines the two. Um, so this is the same method that Grasshopper uses. It repeats the last the last item in the shortest list. So B gets repeated again. So B gets combined with three. Right? You can right click these components, and there are various different. Um, list interpretation methods that you can choose for that component. So here we can say repeat first and now A gets repeated um, to make the list longer. Um, actually let's just make that go to four so it's easier to see. So A gets repeated three times, or uh, two times. There's also interpolate which which what it does is it, it repeats every item to try and be as even as possible across every every element. Um, there's wrap, so here it's going A, B, A, B. Um, and there's flip, which which in this case is not going to seem any different to wrap, but if I start to extend this a little bit further, A, B, C, you can see it goes A, B, C, B, A, B. So it's, it's mirroring it um, as it goes up and down. It oscillates across that list. Okay, and what that's doing is it's now giving us, you know, this A, the output out of A is now the same length as B and it's giving us the, like a data set that works. So if we're working with branches, for example, um, and these are eventually turning into branches, we've got the correct length of branch. Um, the same rules apply with shortest list. So here we can see um, it's just cutting the the end off. So once it hits three, it just kills um, any number after that. Um, you can trim the start, you can trim the end, and you've also got the interpolate, which is going to re remove roughly the right amount of um, items evenly across the list. And then cross-reference, that, what that does is it repeats items in these lists so that they are cross-referencing each other. I'm going to I'm going to reduce these lists down a little bit now. <clears throat> so here you can see A A gets repeated three times because there are three items in in the B list. 
and so we will end up with A1, A2, A3. So there's A1, A2, A3, and basically every combination between those two lists is repeated. So there are various different types of cross-reference systems that you can pick from. The best thing to do is go look up, you know, what a lower triangle cross-reference is, or if you if you're interested in working out if that's going to work for you. I very rarely use cross references in Grasshopper. Normally, you can get away with cross references by grafting an item. <clears throat> so you graft one list and you don't graft the other, and that usually does the same work that a cross reference would do. And it also maintains like a data structure there that's more useful. So we're going to use the longest list function here with the wrap. We're going to make the one zeros and the zero ones repeat based on the length of the geometry. So, so there's there's seven in this case there's seven curves, um, which is going to produce seven one zeros and zero ones in a wrapping pattern. So they alternate. So if I use those those zero ones patterning uh, from the longest list in plugging that into the characters, I then end up assigning individual branches that are appropriate to flip that Warren truss as needed. And therefore getting a diagrid, or at least um, the major, major um, diagonals of a diagrid. Is everyone, is everyone kind of at this point? Do I need to go back a little bit or not? Good. Uh, I don't seem to get that the diagram. Do you want to do you want to share? If yeah. you share your screen. I uh, yes. Would I be able to send you the scripts, Megan? Um, I don't like sending scripts because it does it kind of um, kills the the learning experience a little bit. But um, I'm I'm happy to do it if if you really want. Look, you just got it to work. Max. Checking every box until it works, I guess. Well, so okay, let's just go. Can you go back to the original one? Let's go back. Go back to the top one. What is that doing? Like, let's actually, rather than sort of like trial and error until it works, let's actually understand what's happening. So, what is the output of the list A? So, what can we see here? We can see the zero one as, jeez, I don't know what's wrong with my brain at the moment. We can see the one zero and the zero one, which is exactly what was in the panel. But then zero one is repeating until we get to the seven lines, right? It's repeating. It's repeating um, the first line over and over again. No, it's not the first one. It's oh. it's repeating. Which one? Like because it's one zero zero one, so it's repeating zero one. Yeah, is that the first that. line or is that the last line? Well, this would be first. Repeat now. First, now you're repeating the first one. Yeah. Right. But I'm assuming rap is just doing. Both of them. Yeah. Like, so what? what wrap is doing is, is one, once it gets to the end, it goes back to the beginning. Okay. And it wraps around, and that's why you're getting that zero one, one zero zero one one pattern. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Is anyone else having? You know, they're they're not. It's not working at this point. Megan, you're asking for the script. Is that because uh, I've gone too fast? Um, at the end, I just kind of like to go over things, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. To kind of see it. <laughs> yep. 
do you want me to do you want me to leave it up for a second while while we talk? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Yeah, I guess it's no it's no different than um you know you guys watching the videos, and I know I haven't uploaded the videos, but I will. I'll do that today. Um. So I'm gonna add. I'm gonna add a new complicated. Andrew, you need to share your screen. Uh, I do need to share my screen, don't I? Uh, there you go. Okay, so we're gonna add another layer of complexity to this, um, and that is if you know we've got. Megan, maybe maybe just screenshot it, if you can. Yeah, I've got it. Cool, okay. So, we're going to add another layer of complexity, which is... We've got a bunch of lines, and we've got these diagrids running between them. But now we are going to also have another set of lines. Okay, so I want I need a script that does a diagrid for this set and a diagrid for that one. It'd be no different than you know if I go back to these um these diagrid buildings like the I've forgotten the name of the building but the the building down in um Barangaroo that where there's a we've got a surface and another surface and they're both getting diagridded at the same time. Right? You could you can copy, you know, we can copy this script again. And and then plug our second set of lines in. But then, you know, the number of lines the like the number of diagrids that you might produce might need to increase like infinitely. And so, have we written a script that does that? No, right? But we have in a way, we have um, all we've got to do is add a few extra things at the beginning to be able to sort that out. Um, and this is where things get a little bit difficult. So, just to demonstrate. Uh, if I just grab this set of lines, I know um, this is kind of contradicting what I just said, but if I grab these sets of lines in separate lists, now the, these can be generated by surfaces or they can be generated by anything, but in this case we're just going to draw, draw them manually just to save a little bit of time. Grouping objects. Have you, have you guys been shown a groups before? No. Okay, cool. You can group objects. Um, once you do that, those objects effectively become um, like a single item in Grasshopper's data structure. So I can take two, two lists of objects and merge them together in a flat list as long as they're grouped. So we've got you know, two groups, I'm going to actually do this, make these separate divisions. So we've got two groups with different numbers. Um, when objects are ungrouped, because the ungroup component is taking an item and potentially going to create more, it's going to put those items into branches. You know, just like the divide curve was going to, or just like the characters component, any component that is going to make more than one item is going to put it into branches. So that is going to create two branch structures of those lines. I can, I can now, because we've designed the rest of the script to work with branches, and because we've designed it in a way um, that respects branches, we can plug those into that shift list and the those those two sets of lines are now being both being respected from a data structure perspective 
right? So they're, they're individually working by themselves, but with the same script. So just that little extra, like this particular ad, you know, going, going and grabbing geometry, grouping it, and then running it through an ungroup um, is now allowing us to affect both those sets of lines with that same script. Yeah? Now, people, you guys have done attractor scripts, right? We like one. Pardon? Uh, we did it once. You did once. once. Okay, yeah. so something that's really important about attractor scripts is that it helps you understand that you, you don't have to have a manual input to help define what a variable is. So like at the moment, I've got a division here that's, set, that's dividing by 10, right? And I've got the way that the scripts are set up, these are times two. So both these systems are getting divided by, by 20 effectively, no matter what, no matter what their lengths are. But we can actually, like just like the attractor script, the attractor script is measuring the distance between one point and another, and then using that, using that distance to be able to define a variable for another part of the script. Just remember, you can do that with with anything. You can measure any any quantifiable value and then turn that quantifiable value into a a, a variable for another component. So we can take the we can actually measure the lengths of these lines. Um, and it doesn't matter like this one line could be shorter than the other or whatever. Actually maybe so yeah, we can measure the length of these lines and we can say, hey, divide divide that by a length. So x divided by y. And we can make these lengths sliders. Um, and we want that slider to probably be, you know, in my case, a little bit bigger than, let's make it 50. 100. Cool. And I'm not really going to even care about what's happening with the, the fact that these aren't integers. I can plug these directly into those divide curve components. And now what that's doing is, is actually recognizing it, the script is, is recognizing the length of these lines and maintaining this, f this 50 unit dimension um, and forcing that to be divided across that line rather than you know having a fixed value. And so if I change that for for these scripts, like the, they're going to react for both both line systems. This is obviously not going to work if I change the length of one of these lines um, because the lines are it's now changing the number of divisions, uh, you can see this is getting divided by 37 and this one's getting divided by 22. So that's going to effectively break break the system. This last point is going to get repeated. Come on. Yeah, there we go. So that last point's getting repeated. And so those don't line up. So one thing that you can do here is we can also, like with these lengths, we can start running um, the, these like components that either, um, that run over branches, very similar to the way that they run, like polyline runs over them. So components like average or min and max. So when you plug a branch, like a branched structure or a list into one of these, it looks at them respectively um, and it gives you it gives you one outcome. So it takes a whole branch and, and it usually compiles it into one. So, you know, the bounds here, this is giving us the minimum and the maximum. And you can you can use components, for example, like remap numbers that um, lets you take like a slider 
um, and that slide is mapping from 0 to 1 to that minimum and maximum so as I slide this up and down it gives us you know 50% from the minimum and the maximum or the average the average is going to take into consideration that to, these numbers are getting repeated so on and so forth um, Who's, who's not muted? Just letting you know, someone's not muted. We can hear you. Um, so in this case, I'll use average. So if I plug average in, what's happening is, you know, we've got multiple items um, that are going to be referencing currently the same multiple numbers, but average is going to make that one. And so it's going to repeat that division across all of those branches, right? So that it's a it's an even division, no matter uh, you know how janky or long these components are, they're going to get divided correct, like by the same number. Cool. Okay. So, shall we? take this script to the next level and and build uh, truss in, in Karamba like a cantilevered truss how does that sound using this script yes <laughs> yeah yeah I don't even know why I'm asking because I'm just gonna force you to do it anyway okay so we're gonna build this thing straight out of grasshopper like I'm not gonna even use lines and what the, the what I'm doing is I'm just showing that, that this can be more than just a diagrid right so I'm gonna draw a line Do we have enough time? It's 11. Yeah, we've got two hours, right? Look, look, I, you know, just thinking about that, I've just done, I've done quite a lot in just an hour. Um, does, is, do we, does seriously, does no one have any questions about what we've just done? Um, because I'm, it's a lot. And I, I, I just want to take a breath and, and just reflect back on it. Does any, anyone confused about anything in particular? Okay. Cool. Good. That's, that's promising. So... I'm going to start a line up. I'm going to just move these off to the side. We're going to draw this line STL off in a direction and, and we're going to work in meters. So these trusses are a bit big at the moment now that we're using Karumba. Um, and we'll make a, let's say, tw 20 meter truss. Um, and the what we're going to do, what we've been doing previously has been working kind of in 2D um, and we're going to start, I'm actually going to make this like a box truss rather than a truss um, so it's going to have some dimensionality to it it's not necessarily going to be the most perfect truss in the world but it, it's at least going to be using this particular script um, so we're going to take this line and we're going to draw um, planes on the start and end of that line. Um, and so a good way to do that is either using uh, the perpendicular frames component or yeah, let's just use perp frames. And the division for perp frames is just going to be one. 
that's going to give us a perpendicular frame at the start and the end. Normally when, we, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a rectangle on on the start and end of this thing. Um, actually, let's... Let's actually give this more points. You know, we'll, we'll make it so it's a variable. Is there anyone having issues seeing their planes, by the way? Do you go, all guys uh, know why you can or can't see planes, or why my planes might look different to yours. Basically, planes are infinite, um, so Grasshopper doesn't draw an infinite object to represent them. Uh, in the display plane size, um, there is a, there's a number that defines the size of the plane being displayed. The, those infinite planes are just getting displayed as 10 units long. So, you can change that value and that will then change the scale of the planes as they're being displayed. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw a bunch of um, rectangles across this system and the rectangles are going to change size. Um, so the component that we're going to use to draw the rectangle is the rectangle component. Um, and the rectangle component takes dimensions um, as domains. So the construct domain components can be used to then have numbers that plug into that. We're generating, we've got 10 plugged into the perp frames component. That 10 is actually going to generate more, it's generating an extra plane. So there's 10 segments which makes up 11 planes. We're going to utilize a component like range. Um, what range, I don't need to explain what range does, do I? Range will take a domain, so in this case it's 0 to 1, and it will create that the specified number of segments between it. It's very different to the range in Python. Python's range is more like I guess what um, a series is. So, you know, you've got a start number, you've got a step size and a count, and it generates that, num that many numbers. Range takes the domain and divides it. The reason I'm using range is there's this beautiful thing that happens between the numbers 0 and 1. Like, 0 and 1 is just such a nice domain to work with and there are components that you've probably seen before like graph mapper where you plug them in um, you can set graphs you know we can do a bezier or we can do uh, conical or whatever um, you guys have seen graph mapper I'm guessing no, no? okay graph mapper Basically, the input of Graph Mapper is um, setting the x value of your of the graph. So you can see as I slide this from zero up to one, there's that x value on the graph is sliding up and down, and the output is the y value of that x plane cutting through the graph. So as it goes from zero to one. You can, uh, it's not necessarily linear, but look, if I make the sine wave and make the sine wave go up and down, you can see as that's going up and down, I mean, sorry, is that this number sliding up, the number is going from 0 to 1 to 0 and then back up to 1 and so on and so forth. So, any of these graphs plugged in with a range that goes from 0 to 1, will output values and if I just quickly throw these into the Y component and I just set that Y component to be negative X divided by 2 and X divided by 2 oops expression so what that's doing is it's it's making it's taking this number it's halving it it's doing a negative on one side and a positive on the other 
you can see I'm getting um, it's going in the wrong direction. Plug that into the X. You can see I'm getting a thin rectangle on one side and a thick thick rectangle on the other. This this rectangle over here is zero. And if, if I play it's that's not a linear relationship, so I can play with the demet like the Beziers on this on this curve and we can we can change the, the fall off relationship between those. You guys can see that, right? So we can, because this is going from zero to one and we don't necessarily want our truss to be zero in dimension um, on one side. Um, actually, we probably want to reverse it. We want um, the start of the, the truss to be fat and the end of the truss to be thin. So if I do this, change the Bezier, that's changing those relationships. There we go. We're still getting that going to zero. So you can put uh, numbers into a re remap number. Remap numbers default is zero to one. Um, and so these numbers are going to be um, zero to one um, coming out of the graph mapper normally. So plugging these in, we can grab another domain and actually set the minimum and maximum value of that and that those remap numbers will map these values. So we could say the minimum needs to be 0.1 and the maximum needs to be 1 and so that's now that 0 is getting mapped now to um, 100 mil. Um, and uh, we can set the maximum now so it's like 2 meters for example. Is everyone got this running? Do I need to do I need to uh, repeat any of this stuff? Yeah, I was just wondering what was the expression in construct domain? Uh, the expressions are minus x divided by two and x divided by two. And we can actually copy this. I'm going to use um, that same expression system to then also define the width of this truss. So that we're basically making a truss that's running along that center line. And you can look, all we have to do is change the this construct domain relationship. Like if you want this thing to just be like the the line that we've defined to be the top of the truss or the bottom of the truss. You just need to redefine that construct domain. So you can either make this, just plug it in and so it's the bottom, or we can actually um, invert these numbers. So just make them negative and that will make that line represent the top of that truss. And that, look, this this is actually, maybe, maybe we'll actually use this one, the negative one, because um, it's more like maybe what a roof would have, for example, because you can have a flat surface on the top and you might then have this, you know, vaulted geometry underneath. Um, my graph map is empty. Okay, I if you right click it, and there yeah. should be graph types, and then you can pick all the different types. Oh, okay. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so we've got a bunch of rectangles, and these rectangles are, in a way, going to define the points along our truss where, where we're going to try and set up these Warrens, these Warren uh, diagonals, right? So 
the way that this script that I've written up here is working is it needs lines it needs lines to be able to to produce the the die grid. <coughs> um, and those lines we are dividing those lines evenly to to get the outcome. But so what we're doing is we're we're actually we're actually looking at replacing these points from from this system. So the rectangles that we've drawn, we're we're gonna use these rectangles to define those points. Um so so the the script is gonna be a little bit different. We're just gonna basically be replacing where these points are in that system. But the, these rectangles, you know, if I actually go get those points, so if I go explode these rectangles, um, now everyone, everyone's familiar that if you explode a looping curve, like a periodic one, the one that closes on itself, the, the first uh, point in that is getting repeated uh, at the end, so we've got to uh, at least get rid of the last index if it's looping in this case. So I will give it a minus one. Um, so these points, these are the points that we, we, we are going to use to make our truss, but they are not structured in a way that will allow us to do those um, zigzag diagonals, right? Like if, if I look at the data structure, so if I look at this cull index and I simplify the outcome, the, the data is structured, um, the data is structured so that the branches is relating to the rectangle rather than, how come that's got four points still? One, two, three, oh yeah. Um, so, you know, if I, if I were to draw any polyline across this, then, you know, it's only gonna just basically make up those, those rectangles again, right? But this is actually a two-dimensional matrix. You can see I've got one dimension up here, the zero, and the uh, multiple, you know, indexes down here. So, so this could actually be drawn like a grid in a way and so if I look at the display and we go look at the actual indexes of these points, we're, we're actually looking at 0, 0, 0, 0. If we, we want to connect all the zeros up and we want to connect all the ones up and the twos and all the threes. So we can actually look at using a flip matrix here. This is, this is the perfect example. If I flip that matrix, then uh, if I draw a polyline across that, that's actually drawing um, those those uh, flipped matrix lines um, in in the axial opposite direction as the the rectangles. Cool. That makes sense. This is this is this one can be a bit of a brain twister, so is everyone? I just want to make sure everyone's kind of at that point. Yep, okay. Or oh, more so, um, is there anyone who is struggling right now? Okay. So, I'm just going to, I'm going to quickly break, uh, I'll copy this script so that it's, um, let's copy this guy, and let's just break these, um, let's break this, this up, and we, what we care about is the, 
this divide curve. So these points coming out are the points that are going to be used on one of these divide curves. And what we're going to do is we're just going to shift this list and we're going to make sure wrap is on. We're going to, after it's shifted, we're going to flip it and we're going to use that flipped matrix um, for the other set of points. So, you know, I'll just, so the, those divide curves are effectively being replaced by these flip matrices. Uh, yep. Oh, what did I do? There we go. I'm just going to turn these off. Can you guys, are you guys getting the same sort of like uh, Warren box truss that I've drawn? Or, you know, something where there is a diagonal going between each node? Um, can you go back to what you just did? <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll undo it. I'll, I'll do it all again. Okay, so I've got, we've done a flip matrix and that flip matrix, you know, it changes the direction of the these points, right? Now, with this particular script, these, you know, if we look, if we look how the script is working, we're taking, you know, one of the lines and we're dividing it to get points. Um, and we're taking the shifted line and we're dividing that to get points and then we're using that to build the truss. So this flip matrix is the points. Um, so we don't need to divide a line and to get the shifted list, we just have to shift the list of points prior to them getting flipped. And we, in this case, because it is, it's a loop, um, you know, it's a looping geometry, we want that shift list to actually be it's wrap set to true and it's um, shift can be minus one or one, then these flip matrices can use, we can migrate the, the points, hang on, I'll delete all of this stuff. Um, we don't need the this division expression and we don't need the shift list geometry. We don't need the divide curve, but what we can do is we can move the the line, the wires from the divide curve output into the flip matrix. Have you, you guys been taught how to like drag a wire from one component to another? Yeah. Okay, cool. Just, just in case you haven't, if you hold control shift, you can pull an existing set of wires out and plug them into another component and that works from inputs and outputs, for example. Now, I don't need these two polylines. I only need the polyline coming out of the weave. What that's doing is it's drawing the, di the diagonals across that truss. And the, the rectangles over here are giving us the, like, they're giving us the, the rectangular cross sections. So we can use that, for example, in Kurumba. And this flip matrix, if we, if we have a polyline plugged into that first one, it could be any of those flip matrices, um, that will also give us the flanges um, of each of those trusses. Cool. Hey Will, do you have this particular truss up? Uh, almost. I have just sort of been following one. I can get it done if you want. Cool. 
I was thinking just to give you something to do. Do you wanna do you wanna take this and put it into Karumba? Yep, I'll have to finish building it. Okay. Um, so whilst Will's finish building finishing building it, um, you know, this graph mapper is now giving us control over the the profile of this this truss. So so this hopefully maybe what we can do is actually use this to um, test the Karumba uh, using Karumba actually test what profile is actually useful with these trusts. Is it like does the trust need to just be a linear system like so, or you know can we get away with some some like interesting geometry? Um, another thing you know, is that these, oh geez, the way it divides, you know, it's dividing currently evenly because of the way we're using this perpendicular frame system. You, you can actually play with um, the way, the way frames are defined by using um, like this individual per frame component. Um, if you, you can do the exact same thing with with the range, um, the outcome of this, these numbers that are coming out that are, you know, one to zero. So in this case, if I, we'll just play with this one for a bit. Um, if I plug that into the perp frame component and reparameterize, I don't need to explain reparameterization, do I? Everyone knows that? Or someone doesn't? I know that it's good. It's good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what reparameterize does is it turns any any curve or surface, um, it, it turns all of the, the points in that um, into a number that exists between 0 and 1. So that means, like, rather than when I put a, a one into a reparameterized curve component, that means it's a hundred percent and zero means zero percent and 0.5 means 50% and so on. So some curves, once they get extended or trimmed or um, just drawn in a certain way, um, they, they don't necessarily, they still think like, for example, if you extend a curve, and we extend it by 50% on either side, then the start of that curve in mathematical terms thinks that its start is actually negative 0.5. And so what reparameterize does is it forces the beginning and the end of, of the geometry <clears throat> to be 0% and 100%. So this is just making sure that the numbers that we produce between 1 and 0 are um, going to be understood as percentages and so these perp frames like you can see the spacings of these now is you know it's a variable spacing we can actually you know control the way this truss works um, it's getting inverted now we can have a larger spacing at the beginning and oh sorry smaller spacings at the beginning and larger spacings at the end because you know these or we could go smaller spacings at the end and larger spacings at the beginning you know we're starting to play around with um, that geometry quite a lot now so um, just be my, like I'm just trying to give you guys some some like extra controls on on making this thing um, create some solutions does that make sense? This doing this particular thing. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Will. Are you ready? Yeah. I think I've got. Okay. Oh, the only thing is my webs alternate. I've got to work out why that is. Hmm. Just you wanna you wanna share yeah, it and we'll fix yeah, it. Look, let's have my screen so we can fix it. Okay, let's do it. Is it? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so it's going to be the dispatch pattern. It's your petition. Ah, oh, that's right. I will fix that up. Um, yeah. So we didn't we didn't wrap this. Sorry, I should have I should have done a wrap. Um, so can you use the the one zero zero one? Um, in a panel, like writing them as a single string. Yep. And then doing the split method. Yep. And we want to wrap. We we need to repeat them based on the. Um, what's the best way of doing this? Um, so sometimes we need to sometimes we need to measure the length of branches. Um, so there, you, there's a component called list length. That's that's not going to tell you how long a branch is. It's going to tell you how long the items are in each branch. But there is another component called uh, branch parameters, I believe. Um, can you go to the set section? Set. Um, it's the orange one. Tree statistics. So tree, tree statistics is going to tell you stuff about your tree. Um, if you plug the flip matrix into that, um, actually you don't need the list length. So um, each, so see the p value. The p value is going to tell you how many branches there are, and you can use that with the wrap, the the list wrap, uh, the longest list. Yeah. So if you plug any of those outputs, so P is fine, um, and you set that to wrap. Yep. And right click it and wrap. Then that'll that'll produce the the alternating pattern for you. Sorry, I I forgot to to do that one. Uh, you need to do a split. You need to split your characters split the text. up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That one. It's called characters. It gives you, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you want it coming out of that longest list. You don't want to split it first. No, you want it, you want to split it once it's been yep. wrapped. That's it. Still the same. That technically makes sense, doesn't it? Yep. It makes sense. If you want it to if you want those those to be um different. I sorry, if you want them to match, um then you're gonna have to add one extra line there, which is uh, in that panel, which is zero one. So at like you need three lines in that panel. Yeah. Because it'll go one zero zero and zero one, and then it wraps back yeah. to the start. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Okay, let's do some karamba. Actually, maybe just get rid of that. Get rid of that line because I think what's ha um, if you want the I guess if you want the top and the bottom f um, of that box truss to be the same as well, um, then you can use rather than using the wrap, you can use interpolate. So if you if you make that a single uh, if you make those two lines, yeah. I think yeah. If you see the wrap. If you right click that and set that to interpolate, it'll make the the top and the bottom the same, it'll make the left and the right the same. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. All right. So so we've done look, we've done we did a, a beam and a truss last week in Karamba. <clears throat> look, this is gonna get a little bit more complicated. But it's, but it's just going over the basics again, right? Yep. Yeah. It should it should be the exact same setup as yep. like how to how to plug all the right things yep. in. Um, so I've just got out all of my curves. So we can start plugging them in. Um, 
get our SAML model so we can remi remind ourselves of all the different things we need to put in. So first of all, we'll collect up all our beams. It's going to go into elements. So our line to beam. Uh, but something we need to make sure is that we've got polylines here, but Karamba is only going to take individual line segments. So you got to make sure you explode all the polylines first. What is that curve? Oh, no, we don't need those ones. We don't need those ones because we already we created those when we did our shift list. Just make sure we've got all the right curves. We've got the web. Explode that out. We've got these frames we made. Uh, they should already be exploded. Oh no, they're, they're polylines. Exploded. And the flange exploded. And for now, we we'll start by putting them all into the same line to beam component, but then later on we can come back and we can put them into separate ones. So if we want to give them different properties. Put them all in. Button that. Okay, so we've got our beams. Next thing we need to do is we need to create the supports. So where are we going to define the supports for this? Are we going to have the supports as all four of these points at the beginning? What do you reckon, Andrew? Where, where, should, where would be appropriate to have supports on this structure? So we can we take out our first frame here. Uh, and then get the vertices of that. Point in the flipped list. ones either of those yep Sorry. yep that's probably better so we don't have to oh, no. first, first point cool we've got four and then we get our support component put them in and we'll flatten it Let's start by making them just rigid supports. And we need to apply our load. Again, we can just start with gravity. Then we can come and add some more loads in later when we want. And this should be enough at least to run our first simulation. Then when we can then we can come around and start mucking with the cross sections and materials. So then we need to do analyze. Oh, we need to assemble the model first, is it? Oh, I've, no, I've got an issue with it. I don't have my activated versions. I need to put out my license. I do, but I don't, I thought it would, maybe I need to reactivate it every time I want to use it. That's going to be annoying. Yeah, sorry, it was working last week and I assumed it would just stay on. Uh, Ah, uh, 
this is a pain. Do you want me to try and get that activated? Um. Yeah. Look. Um. Whilst Will's trying to activate it, um. Do you guys want to have a go at, um. Rather than using a line, being able to define like uh, a different type of curve that that def that controls your base curve. So, Will, I'm just going to draw on your screen. Right, I should appear. Yeah. So at the moment, you know, we're using a line like this, and there's. You know, it's defining the, the truss section like so. Um, have a go at, can you make, you know, an arc, for example, or, or you know, just just have a go at that whilst, whilst we're trying to fix this out. Or if you, you know. I need to do the activate here. I don't know if it's downloading file because I've got like a, a license file saved onto my computer. Yeah, so that, it, it can see my license. Let's try. just to get license. Let me just try restart. Looking promising. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to solve this on the spot, unfortunately.
while I try and fix it, do you want to just start making it on yours? And now, couldn't read the floor. Oh, sorry. Okay, so we're going to pick up the first items and make these supports. Just lock these guys in. What's this thing complaining about? That's not good. My crumb is broken too. We're cursed. Um, we're making progress. Uh, okay. I might have to um, reinstall Karamba. Sorry, guys. Does anyone have any questions while this is happening? Um, any questions about Summit 2? Uh, when's it due again? It's due, so we've got a uh, holiday next week, right? Yep, yep. It's, uh, it will be due not on the 27th, but on the 29th of October. Um, and I'll set, all, look, all my deadlines are going to be midnight. So if it's, just let me know if I accidentally pick the wrong time again. Okay. So, basically, uh, one another one. Uh, what exactly are we doing on uh, 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 summon two again? Okay, we you need to build a grasshopper script that represents your one of the ex, uh one of the pasta bridges or the um the cantilever. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. That's clear. Cool, yeah? Then run that through Karamba, mm -hmm. make an improved version of that uh, yep. that design, run that through yep. Karamba, and then build build that physically and show it show it built and show it like show it that it has improved. So we 
Oh, wait a second, so do we need a physical model of this? Eventually, yep. Oh, please. So we need a physical model of the can uh, of these one one of these bridges. Yep. yep. Just marking marking it down. So you've got a bit of time to build that. Mm -hmm. Oh, and obviously, you know, when you're designing the improved version, um, you know, design something that's actually buildable. Uh, uh. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Try not to make it magic. That's one of the yeah. That's one of the 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 major constraints with any computational design. You know, we can make, we can build a script that makes like millions of bespoke shaped things, and then you have to build it. It's like oh shit. Okay, it's working for me now. Do, do, hey, whoa, 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 wait a second. Do we allow you to three printer? Like... <laughs> if you really want to, it's okay. If you've got okay. a 3D printer, yeah, 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 I got to decide me. The the critical, I guess, the critical thing is I want to see you able to show it improved. So, um, if you're going to use a 3D printer, then you need to also 3D print your original bridge. Yeah. So that and then sh and then physically break both those bridges. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm. Um, how do we show like the um, the load, the maximum? Do we need to show the maximum? Like put it on a scale and test out like. Yep. Oh, but but look, if you look, if you don't want to break your second bridge because <laughs> you like it too much, then at least if you can show that it's holding up the same load that broke the original, or you can show your cantilever spanning further than what your uh, your initial cantilever managed to do then you're fine or you show you also need to keep the same length for like keeping the independent uh independent variables like the um yeah the materials and, yep um, yeah yeah the only look the the thing is i understand it's really annoying to build something out of pasta so it's fine just just the but the critical i guess the important thing is that there's You've got a a design that is you've got something that is digital that is being analyzed that then converts to something that's physical. It's the because of almost everything that we're doing in the um, you know uh, built environment um, is, and especially with computational design is I need that to to somehow translate back to something that's realistic and so. You know, later in the term when we design a stadium roof, it, we're not going to be designing, you're not going to be building a roof. Um, you know, it takes too long. But at least the design needs to be considering the realism. And so with these bridge designs and improvements, we also need to be considering realism. And, and a way to do that is to ask you guys to build a physical model of it. Okay, so... Um... I found me now is the uh, the first pasta bridge that I haven't break, I haven't broken it down. So can I just use that for the um, first, like the, as the comparison? If, if you want, yep. Um, but but can you can you break it? Yeah, I, I can break it. I think it's very easy to. Okay, because we if you can break it, then that will at least show the the amount of force that broke it compared to the amount of force that your new bridge can sustain should i break it via my my fingers or should i put like loads you on need it? to put weights on it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and to sh put it on scale and, and like yeah it. unless unless you've yeah. got unless you've got some device that knows how much force you're putting on the bridge while you push on it which i don't think you've got then you need to use weights Alright, cool. Thank you. No worries. Will, is it working for you? Nah. Okay. Nah, I, I thought I made progress, but no. Other okay, all it. good. Um, I'll keep going then. So I'm going to put a gravity load on this. We're going to analyze this. It's the moment of truth. It's working. Okay, so we are going to grab... Oh, this is basically going over what we did last week. So yeah, things and results in where is results there next, yeah, next time we want a model view and then we want the beam view coming out of the model view Oop. cool um and 
And so that's then giving us uh, that deformed view of the the structure. I'm going to uh, I'm going to use the um, I'm going to look at the utilization um, because I want to see what what the what right now which members are actually being used the most. So it looks like it's it's more these flanges rather than than the webs. Um, is everyone else getting? Have they managed to get their trust in and uh, analyzing and deforming in Karamba? Is everyone cool with me just moving forward? Is anyone, sorry, I always need to ask this, these questions the right way. Is anyone, does anyone have an issue with me moving forward with this now? Okay, okay. Absolutely good. Okay, cool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the flanges, sorry, not flanges, I'm gonna set the web up to be, um, a pin joint. Um, the I'm not going to do it to the the boxes. I'm just going to do it to these guys. So we're going to use the um, modify element component, and we're going to work out which one which one we want to work run it on. So it's going to be these diagonals. So we'll set these up as as not having a bending moment. Set that to false. I mean true. No, false. Um, and then we'll replace that in in the Karamba model. So that looks like it's actually come out worse, doesn't it? Oh no, it's actually a little bit better. You can see that deformation is better, or is it worse? It's worse. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll keep that true. We'll keep them rigid for now. Um, and then now we want to play around with cross sections, right? And so uh, the cross sections, the way we, the way I want to play with cross sections is going to be a little bit interesting today. I was, I was going to ask Will to do it, but um, I'll do it. Um, let's just quickly play with the cross sections running with these flanges. So that's uh, not the, it's these guys. So each of these flanges, because I haven't flattened them and I've, because I've put them in their own line to beam component, each of the flange segments are going to be individual items. Um, and there's the, we at least know that there's the same number. So there's 10 in each. So what I can do is I can say, hey, go get the list length. Go create a series for that list length. And we're going to use this expression component. The reason I like using expression is because I can see the, the maths function, but it also it gives me a really um, shortcutty way of using this format function. Um, so if we double click that and just change the format so that it, it's doing this, the, the curly brackets zero underscore curly brackets one, if I plug my series into that and I plug in, you know, a, a panel into X, what that does is it formats text so that it gives us flange zero, flange one, flange two, etc. And we're going to plug these values now into the cross section. Uh, what, what's it complaining about? Oh no, not cross section, ID. So. So what we're end up getting, hopefully, is that these flanges will end up getting the same uh, cross-section ID as these ones and these ones and so on and so forth. 
and we can now use this to build um, our cross sections in a dynamic way um, for for Karumpa. So the aim is these cross sections, at least the, for the flanges, are going to be thicker than the cross sections at the end. So I'm going to go to the cross section function. I'm going to just just we're going to use the um, circular hollow section just because it it saves me having to put in a crazy number of um, parameters. Um, and in this particular case, we're going to use um, actually maybe should we use um. Shall we use the um, cross-section table thing? Cross-section selector. What is it? It's range. Is it press on range selector? Range selector. That's it. We'll set that to Australia. We'll just get um, circular hollow sections. And we're, at the moment, we're getting a whole bunch. Um, now, if I just quickly look in here, you can see 26. They're going from small to large. So, geez, they have made this a little bit annoying, haven't they? Yeah, it's not super useful to use. Um, you can take a cross section though and set its its element ID. Can you break cross sections apart? You know what? Screw that. Let's just make our own. Who cares? Um, so, so we're going to make a bunch of holo circular hollow cross sections. We're going to play with the diameter. We're just going to use, you know, a a standard um, three three centimeter thickness. Is it three or should it be point three? Point three centimeter thickness, so that's three millimeters. Um, and the diameter, what we're going to do is we're going to use use these flanges, the this series that we've set up, um, to to generate those the 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 diameter of the flange. So we're getting ten items from each. We only need one of those numbers, um, so we can just flatten this list and um, get one of them out. So we want to generate 10 numbers. We're going to generate them in a range. And we can set the range to be from like a one one dimension to another. So this is going to be in centimeters, right? So we'll go from zero to a hundred. We'll, we can, we'll play with this a little bit. Now ranges produce one extra number than what you've plugged in. So it's it's dividing it by ten segments. We, we want 10 numbers coming out, not um, 11. So at the moment, this is 11. So we're going to put an expression on that uh, n value, which is x minus 1, just to make sure that it's producing the right number, the right, right range. Also, we, wanna, we want our first um, sections to be fat and our last sections to be thin. So this number up here should be should be inverted, the, the start of the domain should be higher and the end of the domain should be low. Um, and plugging that into the diameter and then plugging in these values, so flange 0 to flange 9, we can basically generate this again based off that number. Flange 0 to flange 9, so I just, um, I'm just i using that list item, I've got a series, I've copied the expression, we're still using the flange here, 
So that's flange 0 to flange 9. We plug that into the element ID. We should get a bunch of cross sections um, with their certain dimensions relating back to those flanges. So plugging these in to our cross section segment in Karumba will give us, you know, those those fat sections at the, the start and, and they'll thin out at the end. And we can now go in and finesse these so that they're um they're not so big. Fifteen and then we can resize these so they go to more, you know five. And so our, our diagonals are getting so fat that that's just becoming solid steel. Um, so actually, let's just come back here and change the that dimension a little bit so that it's not so tight. Um, but you got so you guys can see the benefit of now using that, that list. We can actually start playing with different cross sections across that beam. And the benefit of that. So it means it means I can come over here to the um, and grab a legend. If I look at this utilization whilst I play with this dimension, I can actually pull this number down to the like it's actually pointless, isn't it? Let's set that to 5, and let's set that to 1. Oh, that's 5 as well. We can start playing with those values until... Okay, the, that's getting to the point where... Oh yeah, it's still working. What is going on there? Okay. Yeah, so this thing's being held up by the... <laughs> it's getting held up by the di diagonals. Um, Let's go give the diagonals a a sec a cross section. So we'll just call these all these webs. Oops. Web web web. Let's give it a diameter, a nice tiny diameter. There we go. Yeah, that looks good. So our utilization now now this thing's not gonna get held up by those super fat um, elements. It's doing pretty well. What have I? What am I doing wrong? Uh, these are still pretty fat, aren't they? It still is doing quite well. Uh, that is if I put a load, a different load on the end, it's going to start failing. But do you, do you see where, what, what we're doing here? Like the, this truss is actually, because, because we're actually playing with that geometry a little bit more. Um, you know, if I actually start saying, okay, let's start spacing, sp changing the, the geometry of this thing. If we actually made this thing just abs, just fat, like it's it's actually going to fail. Is it doing as well? Ten negative ten versus yeah. So so just by by thinning these these sections out, we've actually just saved ten like ten percent efficiency on on that structure. 
um, and then also spacing out the the having a non-even spacing. Let's go set that to Bezier. Yeah, that's it doing even better. So you can see most of the forces are are getting saved in it. Like if we make the the cross sections closer to each other um, on the at the beginning, we're getting an even better, I mean, stronger utilization. Um, so it's not as efficient as it seems as if you can see there, as we play with that, that the best result in, in the case of this particular situation is an even division. And with the ends, it's also, it's probably looking for linear. So that's probably a bad, a bad outcome. Um, and then we could also play around with the, the di direction of the vector. So if I put in a, a Z dimension, what have I done wrong? Looks right. Yeah, but it's not. It's um. It's changed direction. See, it's turned. It's turned on its side. Uh, so, oh, guys, it's because it's a um. The perp frame. Uh, yeah, the, the perp frame, and one of them is. So, the guys. Domain. Yeah. So, with the perp frame, um, if you use a line plane, the line plane component, and then chuck a unit Z. Into that then that will uh, make sure that it's always oriented so that the X direction is up. So we can play with that. Okay, that, that should work better. And you can see, you know, it's it's got barely any effect on, on that utilization as I play, as I change the angle of this thing. Um, but it's it's working, which is good. Does that, so so we're, we're kind of at, um, we've got about 45 minutes left. What I'd like to do is set, set the challenge for you to um, have a go at trying, remember how we had um, this system here was able to do um, like multiple diagrids. So we could have, you know, a diagrid plugged into a group and then unmerged and then ungrouped, merged and then ungrouped. Have a go at, you know, how how do you actually get this thing, can we get this to the script to make more than one of these trusses? So, you know, the simplest thing, let's see, am I, have I already ruined my own um, idea? I don't think I have. So, see this line, if I, if I have two numbers plugged into its Y. So it's try like we're actually creating two lines here, right? One truss one truss is coming off one and one the other. What what do you need to do to get this get your script to work so that it can produce two two trusses at the same time instead of one? So have a go at doing that um, for maybe 15 minutes and feel free to ask us questions if you if you need to or not. We'll just sit here. Uh, just a quick assignment question. Yep, go on. Uh, would you guys be, be around on next, ne next week or this agreement is not possible? We're not allowed to be. Ooh. Oops. Huh? We're no yes. Uh, so the 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 student union um, has basically made next week a non-teaching week. Yep. Um, so that you guys can have a breather. So we're not allowed to we're not allowed to teach anything. Yeah. Look, I'm I'm happy to I'm happy I'm happy to answer questions. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's fine.
Yeah, I was, I will, I was thinking about what if I get in, get myself into a big, big hole or something. Yep. On the ground. Yeah, you're more than welcome to ask questions, and I'll answer them. But we can't have a formal lesson. A formal lesson, yeah, of course, of course. Yep. Yeah, Captain. That's it. I want, Good. I want there to be a lesson, but. <laughs> I talk to the union. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's I not. I guess it. They, they don't really do that. I don't. Yeah, that. Yeah, they they care more about your well being, mm. which is you know something that matters. <laughs> well, uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I have a question. Go for it. Mine is broken. <laughs> yep, it's broken just like mine. Or is it broken before? It's only the the. Flange bit. Okay, let's look. If you yeah, share, you share your one. screen. I'm, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug mine in so that mine's not broken anymore. But um, if you share your screen, we'll um, we'll work out what's going on. Yeah. I've got to stop sharing mine. I've got mine working, Andrew. At last, now that we've finished. What happened? I uh, something you gotta like. The audio better activate the license each time you start uh, it up and just mucky around with that. I like your truss. It's a nice looking truss. Yeah, but I only got one. Okay, so what okay, just before before we do anything, what do you what can we see is happening? It's... One of those one of the flanges is doing the right thing, right? Like, or at yeah. least one of these lines, but the other flanges aren't. Yeah. Right? Now, what the, what is the, the other, what is the other flanges profile? Is it, is it the last profile or the first profile in our flange list? So, like, if you, um, hang on, if we, uh, annotate. So this flange, that's our yeah. first, that's the first flange profile, right? Yeah. And then, can you come down this way? Can we look at the end? This is your last, that's your last flange? Yeah. In In probably what that, that profile list thing is doing? And it looks like that particular flange profile is then being applied to every other flange. Okay. So we can, I think we can actually see right now the, the, sh the longest list problem is that that longest list system that Grasshopper does where it repeats the last item over and over and over again is happening here. Right? Okay. So now let's look at this script. See this? See this component here. Yeah. You're you're flattening that as it goes into the, as it goes into this. Um, oh, that doesn't really matter, does it? I don't think this is this is a different one. This one. Uh, it's this one. It's this one. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so you're flattening this list as it comes in, and then what yeah. else have you got? Um, my. My computer just made a weird noise. Was that my computer or was that yours? I don't think it was mine. I, I am worried. Ah, oh, okay. I know what it was. All good. So, so let's go grab a go grab a panel and let's look at what's happening inside this what this this guy here. Okay, so you've got you've got lists that are ten items long, yeah. and I'm guessing you've got four four of those branches. Perfect. Yeah. Now let's look at what this thing's producing. No. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Okay. So you've got a list, you've got you've got all these flanges that are, are getting applied as well, right? Yeah. 
Now, what is happening to, can you just um, zoom out a little bit in your graphs of the script? Thank you. So this list is perfectly lining up with this list in terms of data. Yeah. But there's something wrong going, there's something weird going on in your script. So is there anything that's happening to this data when it's going into the um, into this component? It's getting rid of the branch. What what is doing that? It's flattening it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that flatten is probably what it's doing is it's it's flattening this list, and so this list is getting is getting is actually getting run multiple times over these flanges. Mm -hmm. So if you unflatten that, everything's going to break. Oh. Yeah, but do it. Do it anyway. So what the reason it's breaking is that you, you're actually doing the work, all the flattening work that needs to be done on on this component. Um, yeah. So if you flatten the this all these inputs, rather than relying on the flattening happening at, at these, these ones. Yeah. Yay. Okay, should I unflatten everything that I've done? Uh, well, you don't, look, the, the, we were relying on the data structure in this component. So that's why flattening, like flattening the system here at this point is the is probably the wrong thing to do because we're losing like flattening I, I like to relate flattening to like a nuclear bomb in a way like it just completely destroys everything and flattens it all um, and so you, you don't want to do that until the ver like until it's absolutely necessary and so that's why I prefer with Karumba flattening at the assemble component rather than flattening at these line components because then we can use the 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 data structure that that exists to be able to assign these flange profiles. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, um. Okay. If if you guys don't if you guys don't want to try and delve too deep into the multiple um into the multiple truss challenge. Rather, an, another challenge that might be a little bit easier is um, making these particular diagonals change profile based on whether or not they're going to be in compression or tension. So recognizing there's an alternating tension and compression factor for each of them and then making the profile bigger if it's going to be in compression or making it like a cable if it's in tension. Um, I just realized I had another problem. Okay, go on. <laughs> um, in the legend. Yeah, go, just bring it up. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, because I have multiple legs. Uh, it is because you still, can you go back to your assemble model? Something's not flattened. You need to flatten all of those inputs. The supports, the loads, the cross sections, they all need to be flattened. What's happening is it's actually calculating multiple uh, models right now and by flattening all of them, yeah, there you go. Now they, there's your legend. Okay, thanks. No worries. But that's no. This by the way, that's really good because um, people are going to run into all of these problems um, in the next assignment. I, I'm very confident of it because the next assignment, you know, we're taking working on a truss into working on a a giant roof system that needs to work. So, hey Andrew, in the 
free version mm. under algorithms. Do you have a component called Tension Compression Eliminator? No. Is it in number five algorithms? Yeah, no, okay. It, it seems like it's what you can do. You could put in things like you could yeah. put in cables. Yeah, and, and then, then it'll just kill the cables that you don't need. Chop them out if they're yeah, or like yeah, and it, it makes sure that you're not running something, like allowing a cable to be in in tension. It it what what does it do? It either doesn't calculate well, it, it or it, it kills it. it, 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 it it will just, ta I think it, it takes it out or doesn't calculate it. Yeah. Um, I'm just not willing to spend any money on this thing, you know? No, I, I wouldn't spend money on it personally. No. I don't even know why mods pay pay for it, but I guess they use it a yeah, little I, bit. I, I, I haven't had a chance to use it, but I think Tony uses it every now and then. How much does it cost? No way. Oh. Uh, we can get it for 30 euros plus VAT, whatever that stands for. That's some tax. Ah, oh, okay. Some, some European tax when you get to pay when you cross borders, I think. So it's going to be like 40 euros, I guess. So it'll be like 60 bucks per person. It's not that much. Maybe I can get Hank to buy it. A lab license. It runs on the cloud. Should I try? Maybe I can get him to get it for the second half of the class. Just so we can play around with some, maybe some of the other functions that it's got. And then Hank will have it forever. It's not like a subscription License just goes, yeah, perpetual license. Cool. Yeah. Plus he's got he's good friends with Sasha, so I'm sure I'm sure we can sell something out. Mm, or um are we gonna are we gonna discover that most people are struggling with just simple Karumba and it's not worth it's worth just ironing out using Karumba in the in its most simple form? Yeah, that, that might be the way to go. Yeah. But he might. You know how they do they do. Like they do, kind of force the students to build some stuff with Karumba later on in the degree. I'm pretty sure. Um, like when you know, with the yeah. pavilion. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we use Karumba on that ever. Right. Well, no, I. That might change the class. I guess we could. It could go two ways. We could focus a little bit more on Karumba or we can try and get this stuff drawing in Revit like I, I think Revit, I mean, I think Revit's probably, probably enough, better en enough work as there is I think there's yeah but when we get onto the final task it's just a challenge getting a Karumba working on a big thing yeah yeah but but if we if we need extra material I think it'd be super valuable I don't want uh, yeah I don't want to buy yeah I don't, I don't want to spend money on 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 just being able to get rid of cables, people should be able to get rid of their own cables. Um, so yeah, we'll do Revit. Um, except for well, so industrial designers and landscape architects. If you're there, um, you guys aren't being taught Revit, are you? Nope. And there's no point in you learning Revit. Mm, not that I know of. Okay, that's going to be a tricky one. Did you guys did you guys ever use Rhino 
in your previous degree? No, not for industrial design. You only used Fusion 360? And SolarWorks. Okay. Don't even have a period. Oh, period. Pardon? Period. Don't even have one. I don't know what that means. I don't even have a... Like, this This is my first degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just trying to... I'm trying to work out how to teach you guys that something that applies to everyone because the the problem will be for the industrial designers I'll start talking about Revit and there's there's no point in them learning about Revit so that is maybe that's we can utilize Will and myself being here Will can take the industrial design students or anyone who doesn't want to learn about Revit into another class. That's a good idea. And we can work out something else. Something relevant to you guys. Yeah, that sounds good, actually. This is something I'm going to have to work out over the break. Um, so um, we've got about, I think we've got about six or seven industrial design students. Is that right? There should be four, I think. Okay, there's f four, are you sure? Industrial design? Yeah, yeah, there's... I'm sure there's only four. There's no way there's more than four. Um, well, there's yourself. Yep. Is Anthony Franco? Yep, Anthony, Jeremy, and Jen. There's Genevieve. Jeremy, yep. Tan. Yep. yep. Uh, okay, that's it, I guess. That's it, yeah. Um, Nicole... Nicole, you're here. Your power's turned on. Oh, yeah. Apparently, I think it's because of the rain. They okay. um, couldn't do the work. Okay. <laughs> um, Nicole, you, you did the... In, in t I mean, sorry, landscape architecture degree? No, architecture. Architecture. Who's the landscape architect? I don't know if there's anyone no, doing landscape. I'm, I'm uh, not no, asking yeah. you. Oh, 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 oh. No. yes. Oh. There, there is one. There is one. Yeah. Uh, 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 that, 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 uh, I'm not really fond of Revit. Yeah, I, look, I I hate Revit. I hate it. I love Grasshopper. I I I can't I can't say that you love Grasshopper, but you know Grasshopper ver or Rhino versus Revit, I'd pick Rhino and Grasshopper any time. Oh, hundred percent agree. But that is not what the rest of the industry is doing um, at the moment. They. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you guys, if you guys want to get a job, um, they'll probably get you to do a Revit test. Um, even, even though you want to use Grasshopper. So... Is that Revit test difficult? <laughs> um, it's, it's a different test in each company. Will, did okay. you have to do a Revit test at Mott's? No. Okay. Do you know if other people have to do Revit tests? Probably if you're a Revit drafter or... Yeah. Yeah. Um... The... How it looks. Pardon? How does it look? How does it look? Like, Revit test? The Revit test? It depends. Yeah. The one that we do at... The one we have at Cox... It's like a web-based test. And you you run through it, and you have to download download little Revit files, and then open them up, and the, there'll be a question that it'll say like, how many work sets are, are in this, or um, or like uh, after you turn on a particular phase, how many windows can you see, and then you have to effectively like do uh, uh, they've like hidden uh, stuff in those revit files so that you you have to um how to get it yeah and then 
they've um, they'll also kind of ask questions like if if there's this happening, like if if a warning pops up after you do a particular thing, um, you know, why which one which why, of these options would, would you pick? Happen? Yeah, not why would it happen, but and it, oh. it, there'll be multiple choice thingies there as well. Ah, oh, okay, I got it. I got it. Or at least I saw something similar here in Chinese. In yeah. Chinese format. Yeah. Um, Who else did that test, Andrew? I remember it would have been like two years ago, I remember watching someone do it, but I haven't seen it since. You didn't have to do the test. No, I, I didn't have to do it. No, but that's that's because I you, you had my... friend just did it. <laughs> you took, but Will's asking about who would have to do it at Cox. Um, every, I think any graduate architect has to do it. Okay. Yeah. So Does anyone have to do this? Pardon? Like, in computational design, do we well, have to do Well, so Cox, or... Cox has got a bit of a, you know, we've got a bit of a strong relationship with the computational design degree. Yep. Um, so I usually hire people out of the degree. Like, for example, I hired Will. Yeah. Um, and um, it was like it was like an invitation rather than like a like a seek or a, an agency um, ad because I because I know Will and I and I need, knew that we needed someone and so I said well you, you should bring this guy in and interview him um, so they and they weren't hiring Will or we don't really hire computational designers to do Revit work. That's changing. There are more like there. Will, for example, yeah, was it? A, Will we was it? Being class. <laughs> yeah, and, and, no, that's not. That's not. That's not the reason. It's not that you were taught Revit. It's that um, people people expect more teams are using Revit, at least at Cox, um, and so we. So Will, for example, even though he knew, knew how to use Grasshopper, was also using Revit for a lot of what he was doing near the end, which is probably why he quit. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but there's like the, the, there are more teams doing doing their work in Revit, so we need people who can interface with that. Um, so even just exporting stuff out of Revit and then working on it in Rhino or Grasshopper and bringing it back in. Um, and, but Rhino Inside is changing all of that. It's, it's making, it's making uh, us Grasshopper users, um, actually able to make Revit do what we want it to do. Because like, for example, Nicole and Megan, the reason why you probably hate Revit, Megan. I'm not putting words in your mouth. Are you are you not a fan of Revit either? Or at least Nicole. The reason why Nicole probably hates it, and the reason why I hate it, is that um, it restricts you from doing your like actually designing. Like it gets in the way of designing. Um, like you want to draw a wall. And you want the wall to do something a little bit funky, and Revit says, "Well, that that's not a wall," and it'll make you jump through all these other hoops just to get that geometry working. Um, and Grasshopper lets you do whatever you want, right? As long as you know how to do it, it doesn't get in the way. Um, so one thing that's really one thing that's be really difficult to do is draw a structure like a like this truss. Actually, why don't I just do that? Did you just shift shift another computer? Yes. Ah, oh, okay, makes sense. <laughs> Ah, that's the same stuff I was doing. Hmm? That's the same, same kind of things I was doing. Like, I got a I got a personal server downstairs. I have this, I'm on my personal desktop, 
at home. Yeah. And yeah. instead of into office. No, my my laptops um my laptops on the floor over there next to the nappy mm. see the nap the the change table. Mm. There's a laptop on the floor that I I rather than having to unplug all the stuff on my desk, I just plug my laptop into my modem and then I remote into it. Ah, yeah, makes sense. So I'm just, That's what I just being lazy. Let me just demonstrate. So, uh, Nicole, mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna. I'm using the same license. Um, um, it would be pretty annoying to draw this truss in Revit, right? I've never done one, so I wouldn't know. But like, even just yeah. even going about drawing, it's going to be annoying, right? Probably. Yeah. Like, especially getting this type of curvature as well. Oh, 100% with the curve. It's just, it just hates it. I just can't with yeah, it. Just love it. Love it. Just hate, hate Anderson okay. curvature. Okay, let's do this. Let's see if I can copy across, across the remote system. <laughs> I think it'll work. It's just file. Yeah, that yeah, copy paste show show works. Yes. Yeah, but it's like when you copy stuff from Grasshopper, it copies a text yeah. string, and when you paste yeah. it, it it's pasting text. Um, text. Okay. Yeah, it's Let's... transforming the, the the code into uh, into into some kind of a te text format. Yes, I don't have. I should I should connect to my VPN before I do this because then I'll get a template and I'll be able to get my Cox structural members in. Cool. Graphic is no longer used. Mm -hmm. Pardon? No, the, your screen just says like Revit Revit to to two thousand twenty is no longer used for like something. Yes, it is. Any project we we started in Revit twenty twenty is still being used. Is still using Revit twenty twenty. Ah. Um. Okay. So the only issue with this is it's going to be in um millimeters well I mean in meters or well, rabbits in millimeters but look you can see you can see these the the members of the trust kind of being displayed in Revit um, I'm going to scale these up so they're in millimeters I'm not going to explain necessarily what I'm doing just demonstrating like why this thing's awesome. So these are just the center lines. So normally like in Revit, you'll say, okay, here's a beam. Yes, I'd like to load one. Yeah. Fuck, I hate Revit. Cox. Cox. Search. CHS. Can I just load the whole thing? Yeah, good. Okay. No, 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 no. Beam. Andrew, uh, I think you unloaded a detail item. Ah, uh, bloody hell. Why would you why would you even have detail items for <laughs> beams? Um, I guess it's <sighs> makes things <laughs> more complex. Uh it's a detail item, you're right. Uh, profiles. I want this one, right? Potentially, yeah. Try that. Yeah. 
follow section. Overload it. Okay. Beam. Ah, oh, you bastard. That's what? I what? Now, so these kind of things always get getting in the way. Or yes, it, it's it, always. And, and a... to try and filter by structural framings. Click the little. Yeah, yeah, there you can get some beams there. Right, okay, yeah. cool. We'll just use this one. Uh, this one. Yes, this type of stuff gets in my way all the time, but normally it's set up by someone else. Sure. Um, okay, that's letting me draw that beam. Okay, so with Revit, you have to draw everything in 2D, like it, it wants to draw it on a plane, and then you've got to pick it, and then you can move it up, and you know, that's not like it won't even snap. You know, it's not snapping to something in um, Grasshopper anyway, but normally, like, with some structure like this, you've got to go to the, the end level offset and then change its 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 height through this to be able to, to actually make it work in 3D. Um, so it's a, it would be a pain in the ass to draw this. Um, and no, I think most people have given up drawing these types of things in Revit um, manually. And they use tools like Dynamo. Dynamo is awful, um, anyway. So, uh, like, look, I'll I'll just do it r this really quickly. I'm gonna build um, add beam. So. Rabbit parking inside. Oh, this, uh, okay. Oh, look, it's, <laughs> it's gonna stop inside. It's like it, there's a there's a few little bugs there, but um, at least it does the work. Like it's actually that's pre it's working right. Nicole, is this mm. you've never seen this Revit do stuff like this right? That that quickly? Absolutely not. Do you want to learn how to do this? That would be good. Okay. Um. Wait, what is this plugin? This is Grasshopper. No, the oh, the strong. tab you're on. What? <laughs> it's the Revit, the Revit tab. <laughs> There's a Revit tab when you run Grasshopper inside Revit. Oh, okay. So basically, it's doing like uh, Revit and Rhino and oh. Rhino inside their uh, Grasshopper. Yeah, so it's running Rhino inside Revit, and then you can run Grasshopper inside that Rhino, and that Grasshopper can connect to Revit. So, uh, buh, 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 where am I doing? I want. See, the, these are doing weird um, top Sounds of like top of steel. Nothing. No, it's the um, offset. Z justification it needs to be center, like that. It doesn't even look right. It looks like this family's drawn shit, don't you? doesn't it? Mm. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Do you see that, Will? Yeah, yeah. Can you have to change Y justification to center? Uh, just move, to the, move, move a bit to the to the, to, to the right. There's something weird happening. Yeah, no, it's, they're, not, they're not on their center lines. You see? So that, that's the center line. It, this one, if I set it to the center, it's the family. The family's actually been drawn poorly. Yeah, the family just sucks. Yeah. Um, which is normal. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Tom, but it's normal. If you if you ever are watching this, Tom Wong. <laughs> but these CHS families suck. I'm going to tell you about it in, in, after this. But yeah, um, we can do Z justification. I think it is. Let me just double check. Two, so they're currently set to two. If I set this to one, yeah, you can see that's changing. Like I can change their relationship with. 
Bam. Oops, there's uh, something weird. Um, you mean these guys? Yeah. yeah I don't, um, is it because this is too short? Is it because they've got they've been set to do joins? It's been an end level offset. No. That's the height extension. No. Is it because these are completely vertical? It can't be. Let me change the height. Let's see if changing the height helps. Like it's gonna. I reckon it's because these are too short. I mean, oh, okay. No, it's not. No. no. I guess it should be the normal thing. Yeah. Man, so good using Rhino insights. Okay, I. <laughs> you just can't do this with Revit. Um, I, I'm going to put these into separate com uh, components, and that'll probably work. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, should change the height of that. Let's delete these. Ah, oh, Jesus. Okay. Um, yeah, so that. Like that technically should show up in my plans. Um, there it is. I should be able to see it in my sections. There we go, there's my section. And then I should be able to do this. I should be able to go whoop. And it changes automatically oh. in Revit. Oh, bam! Jeez. Um, and we can do that with a lot of things. Um, we can so the I guess if when we when we're working on the stadium um, for the third assignment, um, if we start if I show you guys how to bring this stuff into Revit, then you can rely on Revit to do a lot of the. Um, the documentation that you would normally would have had to done out of Rhino. So it's, it, Revit is good for some things and doing things like plans and sections and whatnot quickly, it does do. Making pr like good looking plans and sections is a bit difficult for it, but um, it's definitely possible. Um, uh, at least it's um, a bit smarter than what you say, AutoCAD. Oh, no, yeah, there's, Audic has just a line drawing tool. Mm. So, yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> you're talking about Revit. At least Revit's better than Audic had? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, mean, I, was, I was doing, well, I was at high school, I guess. High school, high school AutoCAD class. Uh, AutoCAD. Yeah. AutoCAD uh, lesson, uh, and... It's a nightmare. I was taught I was taught how to use AutoCAD when I was at uni. Um, and it was only through my own uh, initiative that I learnt how to use Rhino and Grasshopper. And like there were times where um, like I was doing I was doing this like repetitive stuff in AutoCAD. It took it it might have taken me like five hours to draw like the studs throughout a building, for example. Um, and then once I had Grasshopper, it was like, okay, that took me like a minute. So like hours and hours and hours of work for me was was saved in Grasshopper. And then as well, like architectural design studios are very much like, you turn up one week and, and the tutor kind of suggests you to change things significantly. And so all the work that you'd spent 
doc like drawing and documenting and getting all the drawings so that you can actually sit with that tutor and actually talk about what's going on all of that stuff's kind of like wasted you have to do it all again from scratch and so grasshopper for me was like perfect yeah, it seems a bit, 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 bit digital yeah digital since parametric oh yeah parametric yeah Wait, wait a second. What's the difference between digital and parametric? Well, AutoCAD is digital. Yep. But it's, it's digital system. But it's I wouldn't say that um, it gives you parametric control. So it does, but it doesn't give you the same is... parametric control that Grasshopper does. Ah, uh, ah, uh, but got it. Yeah, I, I guess I kind of getting it. Yeah. Get an idea. <sighs> um, any um, any questions for three minutes? Yeah, someone was going to say something. Yeah, I've got a question, and it's probably opening a can of worms that's probably too big for three minutes. Yeah. But um, I'm interested. So this, how does this work underneath? Like, what's the short kind of explanation of how this works? Because I'm interested in how this could work with something like SolidWorks. Right. Um, oh, you mean how does Rhino what? Inside work with Revit? Yep, yep, exactly. Um, so Revit has an API. Yep. Um, the when when you click on any of these buttons, like drawing a yep. wall, um, mm -hmm. Revit's actually probably actually sending an API call to itself uh, and then running right. that script, uh, yep. like running that API script. And Rhino works the same. So you know, if I pull up Rhino, the command line in Rhino. Um, is in a way an API. So uh, just typing text, for example, that r that's an API function call. Um, and you've guys, like I know you, you're probably aware that there's like a Python component in Grasshopper. Yep. This Python component, you know, it loads Rhino script syntax. The Rhino script syntax, this is all an API. So R um, rs.add arc function you know with a plane a radius and an angle all of that stuff's api um activated and what rhino inside does is rhino's just got a, a switch set on it now that lets you run rhino inside any other program and mcneil have uh they've committed themselves to at least writing the component tree to connect to other programs like Revit, like they really care about connecting to Revit, but they don't, uh, but they've they've flick, flicked this switch that lets Rhino run inside any program rather than just Revit. Ah, oh, sweet. Um, so, um, you know, if I go Rhino inside Unreal, um, some people have started the process of trying to run like Rhino inside the Unreal Engine editor mm. and controlling the Unreal Engine editor from Grasshopper. So, you know, the results, I'm not sure what the results are from a game design perspective, but, you know, you can see here it's actually producing a live Unreal representation of this Grasshopper model. Uh, in, in right. the editor, right? So, the thing is, you're really now getting into C sharp, right? You've you've got to develop um, a pl like a C sharp plugin for the software that you want to run this in. If someone hasn't set that up, and then you've got to plug Grasshopper into that, and then get Grasshopper to connect to the API system of the software that you're running. So, in this case. SolidWorks, right? SolidWorks is a nightmare. Um, API is a nightmare. Yeah, so you've got to use the SolidWorks API. Now, the the other thing with SolidWorks is SolidWorks is, can be quite... Like, SolidWorks is actually quite similar to Revit, I think, in that, um, like, if you draw... If you try and draw something in Revit, um, like, for example... Uh, if I go grab that okay. Revit tab, if I say, hey, we want to draw a floor in Revit, then 
this component, it needs the boundary curve, it also needs the type of the floor, it needs the level for that floor, and it needs the like whether a structural true and false value. Um, right. And from what from what I can tell with SolidWorks, SolidWorks is very like it's almost like you you if you're going to write Grasshopper script that works inside SolidWorks, that Grasshopper script has to basically inject some of the stuff that it's producing into SolidWorks every so often. So, you know, if I've defined a plane, you need the planes to be put into SolidWorks so that SolidWorks can actually draw stuff on those planes, right? Yep, yep. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Why, why would you want why would you want to like SolidWorks has got a reasonably good um, parametric engine in it already? Is it is it because Grasshopper is just a, a little bit better that you want to use it? Yeah, I think it's more just um, thinking about what you could do with it because I think what's challenging is drawing the trust system isn't necessarily hard in SolidWorks, mm. but having those repeated patterns. Um, would take a while to draw, and then you can't change it. Yeah, um, yeah. So flexibly. it's yeah. Fe- I, I call. I think the term is feature-based parametricism. Yeah. So it's the same as the. It's the same as um, Revit's family component system. You you basically need you need to draw into SolidWorks the things that it that exist. So you can't, you can't, other than maybe the array, there's some array functions, right? Yeah. You can't say, hey, take this curve and divide it this many times and then produce like cylinders off that in this vector. You have to go and actually draw those cylinders in and then you can control maybe their parameter and the dimension that they are away from another part of the design, right? Yeah, and I don't even think SolidWorks has divide curve. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, because <laughs> you know, why, like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the thing is, so why would you want SolidWorks? Okay, so let's say you've done your, you've made a graph of a script. Why are you putting your object into SolidWorks in the first place? Anyway, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, most of the time it's to get it manufacturable and and ready, and it's kind of the the standard, and it has a lot of good features like um, snap fit design, yep, yep, um, screw bosses, things like that that are kind of handy. So, all right, I hear. It. So yeah. you're you're basically going to run into this problem that I had with Revit like ten years ago, which is <laughs> we even though using and still running into it now, even though using. You want to use this tool, which is Grasshopper, but everyone else is using this other tool, which is SolidWorks. And mm-hmm. there's features in it that are useful, but the one thing that it doesn't really do is give you an environment to do good, good automated designing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm guessing it, you can probably import, you know, IGS files or solid, you know, solid file formats into SolidWorks, right? From mm-hmm. from Rhino, but they're static, like they lose all relationships with with the original set. It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. Yeah. As well, because Rhino like... Rhino's been designed. Rhino was originally designed for industrial design. It was. It's industrial design for boat building. Yeah. Yeah. It's really tricky. Yeah, and then Rhino's okay, but it doesn't have a um a feature tree. Or I, I'm not very experienced with Rhino, but um, SolidWorks is quite good because it has a feature tree, so you can kind yeah. of keep track of how this, things are going. This is the fe- um, This is your feature tree, right? And that's what really what SolidWorks needs. I find the problem with SolidWorks is simply the way the interface is set up doesn't allow for like number sliders and mm. things like that. It seems more of a a user interface issue than necessarily it's, how it works it's yeah. yeah i guess they haven't written well that but as well they haven't written the functions that allow you to do things like producing multiple items mm. you you still it's still a feature-based system yeah um yeah it's a tricky one yeah 
hopefully someone solves that <laughs> in the next few years or less. It'll have to be me. <laughs> well, let's let's see. Uh, Rhino inside SolidWorks. Yeah, it doesn't look like anyone cares about it at the moment. What about Fusion 360? If they were going to do that, I feel it would almost go the opposite way. Um, Fusion 360 into Rhino. I've always found the user interface for Fusion uh, a lot easier than Rhino's. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm just I'm just thinking because um, Fusion 360 has the same sort of like modeling, a similar modeling environment to SolidWorks, right? Mm. As uh, in, it's yeah. it's fe it's a feature based modeling environment. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, if anyone's going to do it, it'll be McNeil or you. It won't be Autodesk. <laughs> or, well, I, yeah, who makes SolidWorks? Um, Dissolve? I think they do Cartier as well. Yeah, look, they... They have an absolute monopoly on <laughs> the industrial design industry and how it yeah. works and what it can do. It's the same as Autodesk they... with our architecture. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, food for thought. Look, yeah, so one of the one of the big things with like with well, the reason we're learning Grasshopper is because it, it's the most versatile and it's the, the thing that gives us the, the biggest the the best outcomes, I guess. But I guess the caveat to all of that is that this keyword which is interoperability, um, and uh, Grasshopper and McNeil have said that they care about interoperability they care so much that they've they've literally unlocked their software to be run wherever you want right um they've even they've even allowed their software to run headless on a server um under this thing called rhino compute um so you can actually make web web-based api request calls to a rhino server that you've set up and rhino and grasshopper will do the process so you could technically set processes up um, in Grasshopper and then get SolidWorks to do an API call to Rhino to get Rhino to solve a problem and send that problem back to SolidWorks, for example. So McNeil, wow. McNeil have said, we are, we, they are going to be the, the forefront runners when it comes to interoperability. Now, mm. it's these other programs, but the thing is other programs are going to need to flick that switch sometimes or at least someone has to put effort into it to get their head around the API for example I think it was some someone was talking someone has actually looked at the SolidWorks API to actually work out what's going on um, but once you've delved into that once you've gone past that software engineering uh, hurdle which is actually making a plugin for SolidWorks that runs Rhino inside and then getting into Rhino inside and getting Rhino inside to connect to um, SolidWorks API. Once you've done that, then you can start controlling SolidWorks with Grasshopper. You just need to know how to write Python or C Sharp once, once you're in there. Right, yep. Okay guys, ha have a good week off next week. Or at least have a have a nice week um, working on assignments, um, and I'll catch you guys with the start of assignment three in in two weeks time. Yep. Thanks, Andrew. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Thank you. Quick question, Andrew. Should yes. we do it tomorrow? Yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. And as well, um, if you want to do next week as well, we can do next week, Tim. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Bye.